And the rest of you can open to Hebrews chapter 11. It's in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I will rarely ever recommend you going and looking at uh, one of my messages online. But I will say that if you missed last week, I would encourage you to go check that out. What you do, you go to our, our website, firstgrace.us. And there's a, it's, there's a current ser- sermon series there. You can click on that and then um, f- follow the YouTube link. Um, because we answered the question, why do, good things, or why do bad things happen to good people? And I know a lot of you wonder why. And so uh, we addressed that last week. We're, in, uh, we're wrapping up a series, a five-week series, which, by the way, can I just say, at... Um, Every opportunity I want to point out to you that there is a God and that He is alive and He is active and if we follow Him and listen to Him then He has things for us to say and He will lead us in the right direction. Do you believe that? So sometimes that rolls out in a big way and sometimes that rolls out in a small way and we need to acknowledge both, that they both happen. So here's a small way that this is going to happen. Jolie and I are going to be gone next week. Pastor Dusty is going to be leading us, uh, bringing the word. And I didn't know that when I set out to have a five-week series. But God did, didn't he? And so we had a five-week series, and it ends today. And so then Pastor Dusty can start afresh next week, fix all of the mistakes that I've been making in the last you know, month or so, and get you all right on, the, on the, the right track. But just think about this. God knew. And so when we listen, see, usually you have a six-week series. For some reason, I just knew very clearly from God that I was supposed to do a five-week series. Because God knows. Doesn't he? Listen to me. There is a God. He is alive. And He does want what's best for you. And He wants to show you things. And He wants you to walk on a particular path. And if we just listen to Him, then he will, He'll lead us in the right path in the right path. So this is a little silly thing, but it just proves over and over that there is a God. And so we're wrapping up a five-week series. We called it the game plan, God's plan, for, huddle up, God's plan for your life. And so we huddle up, we kind of get together, we say, hey, let's, let's talk about, you know, make sure we're all on the same page and roll out instructions and like they do in a football huddle. And so we have a little bit of football gear here and And uh, so the first week we talked about the game plan, God's plan for your life. What's God's plan for your life? It's pretty simple, harder to do, but it's simple. Glorify Him. Oh man, I don't know what that, how does that roll out? Well, we talked about that in link. It's online. Again, if you want to follow that. So to glorify Him, how do we do that? Well, we follow His commands and we push into a relationship with Him. Not, Not religion, a relationship with Him. And we try and obey the commands, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. When we do those things, we glorify Him. It's impossible to do it all the time, but then He forgives us and we move on. So then where do we get our game plan? The playbook, which is God's Word. That was week two, the playbook. This is God's Word. It not only is true, it contains truth that we need to know. All all truth is from God and it's our instructions on how to please Him with our life. Then we talked about halftime. And so week three was halftime. And I just rolled out a whole bunch of texts to you. Um, just a fraction of the text in God's Word that is encouraging to you. So we did a halftime kind of an encouragement thing. And then last week we talked about an injury report. So things, bad ha- things go bad, right? And we suffer and we get sick and we lose things. And why do, why do bad things happen to good people? And that's what we addressed Last week. And the, the takeaway phrase from last week was that God is... Okay, good. Three of you, remember. The rest of you, firstgrace.us. Okay, no. All right, God is enough. <coughs> Pardon me. 
And now today I want to talk about a post-game wrap-up, a post-game evaluation. How do we do? What do we do well? Uh, what do we need improvements on? Highlights, the low lifes, and kind of how are, we, how are we doing? So that's what I want to talk about. And I want to use Hebrews chapter 11 to jump off on that. Okay, so tomorrow is Veterans Day. And we will we honor those uh, who wore the uniform, who served our country, who, who uh, stand there willing to, to uh, secure our freedom. And so I want to just honor those um, right now. So if you, in any branch, for any length of time or whatever, if you have served in our military, would you stand up, please? There are those of you who did heroic things, and there are those of you who do not feel very heroic, but we, we owe you a debt of gratitude, and we appreciate, we appreciate what you've done. And so I want to honor that. Now, the Bible lists some heroes as well, and, and they are listed in Hebrews chapter 11, and they're heroes by faith. And so, um, if you're there, let me read the first two verses. Well, first of all, let me just, you don't have to turn here. I'm going to show you in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that God God doesn't call, just a reminder, before we list, we go down through this, these heroes in Hebrews chapter 11, who did remarkable, remarkable things. And yet we're reminded that God doesn't call the brightest and the bravest and the wealthiest and the most talented. And He doesn't call out all of those for His service. He actually uses people on the, sometimes on the other end of the spectrum. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 and following says this, Brothers, consider your calling not... Many are wise from a human's perspective, and not many are powerful. Not many are of noble birth. But instead, God has chosen the world's foolish things to shame the wise. And God has chosen the world's weak things to shame the strong. God has chosen the world's insignificant and despised things, the things viewed as nothing, so that He might um, bring to nothing the things that are viewed as something. So He takes things that are viewed as something and it brings them down and he lifts up things that are nothing and he makes something out of them uh, so that he might bring to nothing the things that are viewed as something so that no one can boast in God's presence because God does it but from God him you are in Christ Jesus who for us became wisdom from God as well as righteousness and sanctification And redemption. Everything that we have is because of Jesus and through Jesus. Everything of value that we have is because of Jesus. And so these men and women that we're going to look at over the next few minutes are examples. They're not, they didn't start out being the bravest and the best and the brightest and the uh, whatever, um, but God, because of their faith, God made them that way. So Hebrews chapter 1 says this. You can tell I'm hurrying. I need to hurry. Um, so I'll talk fast and you listen fast and we'll ask God to increase and to work mightily. Hebrews chapter 1, uh, 11, verse 1. Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for the proof of what is not seen, for by it our ancestors were approved. Tracking? I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I, I don't. It's like this is, this is two of the most confusing verses to me when I just read them over quickly 
in Scripture. I don't know what does that mean. Now, faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For by it our ancestors were approved. I'm, I'm not tracking with that unless I really, really press in and try and figure it out. Here's what God's doing. God's showing us that we're dealing with two different realms. We're dealing with the realm of what's seen and the realm of what's unseen. We don't have to be convinced about what's seen. So, let me ask you this question. Um, would it amaze you if I told you that there are cornfields in this area? <laughs> well, no. Because you've seen them. You, you've seen them. You, there's one right out there, right? Surrounding us, right? You've seen them when you came here this morning. You saw them with your eyes. It's what's physical. It's what's real. It's what you can see with your own eyes. So you don't have to be convinced of that. But then if we start saying, but you know what? There's a creator. There's a God who made everything. He made the trees. He made the grass. He made the corn. He caused it to grow. You're like, I can't see that God. So that's where faith comes in. Faith makes real what is unseen with our eyes. We don't have to be convinced about what's really around us. I mean, we, we really see it. We know it's there. But what about the God who made everything? What about the God who sustains everything? Well, we can't see it. So it takes faith to, to see that, to know it's real. Look at verse 3. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God so that what is seen, what we can see, has been made from things that are not visible. God created all things. We can't see Him, but we can see the result. Faith is knowing that there is a reality on a different level of things that we can't see. Now does it make sense a little bit better? It does to me, so I hope it does to you. Faith is trusting in what you can't see, and not because it's easy to trust in what we can see. These people that we're going to talk about really quickly here are, are people that trusted in unseen things and did miraculous things even though they couldn't see the future or see how it was going to lay out. They can't see God. They just had to trust. They just had to have faith that God is real and that He would do what He said. So this morning, here's what I want to ask you. As we do our, our post-game evaluation, I want to ask you a couple questions. <coughs> How's it, how did it, how's it going for you so far? When you look back on your life, this, the post-game, wherever you're at here lately, when you look back at your life, how are you doing in your faith? Are, are you, what things are you doing well? What things do you need to improve on? What can you do better? Do you even have faith in something unseen, or are you trusting only in what you can see? We're going to do an evaluation of what, where we've been. Like, how did the game turn out? I'm not even talking about whether we won or lost or whether you did great or whether you did bad. Where are you at right now? Because we're all on a different level. We're all on a different... We all feel like we've played a different game. So I'm just asking you, from your point of view, how would you evaluate the past? How you doing? We're going to answer that, address that again in the end. So let's look at some of these uh, characters, some of these people that lived. And I just want to point out a couple things really quickly on, on several of them. I don't know how many we'll hit. Um, so let's, let's look at some of them. By faith, Abel offered to God. We're Hebrews 11, verse 4. <clears throat> By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By this he was approved... As a righteous man, because God approved his gift. Now, God said, here's what I want you to... This is Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel. God said, here's how you can please me. Here's the gift that I want you to give me. Um, Abel obeyed God. Cain did not. And, and he was considered uh, approved. Because God approved his gift. And he was approved as a righteous man. Listen to this. Even though... Look at that next phrase. Even though he is, what? Dead. So what happened is Cain got 
jealous because God approved of Abel's gift and not Cain's, and so Cain killed Abel. You've heard that story. Even though Abel is dead, God says he's better off because he's been approved, because he obeyed God. Simple little thing. We're going to go on. Are you tracking with that, though? It's better that he's dead, but obeyed God than the other way around. Cain, Cain had, it, it, had it pretty bad. Okay. Um, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not experience death, and he was not to be found because God took him away. So here's what's crazy about Enoch. When we read in the Old Testament, we know that he's just like walking along or whatever someday, and God's like, hey, I'm going to take him home. Boom. He never died. Boom. Now, he was, it says right here, for prior to his transformation, he was approved, having pleased God. So immediately we start thinking, man, he must have been a great guy. He must have been doing all the right things. He must have, you know, just like Job last week, we talked about Job, how he was a righteous man, how he loved God, how he turned away from evil, how he did right things. Man, Enoch must have been awesome at all this stuff. And that's why God approved of him and called him righteous. Is that, is that what he says? No. Keep reading. Look at verse 6. Now without... Help me out. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. I, I've been telling you over and over and over at funerals and here and everywhere that it's not what you do it's what Jesus did, and this is just another reminder. It's all throughout Scripture. It's not about you going to church or being baptized or going through confirmation or doing all these kinds of things. It's not about that. Enoch was a righteous man, and he did all kinds of great things, but he was approved because he had faith. faith. Thank you. He believed in a God that he couldn't see. And he trusted, and that's why he did the things that he did. I'm not saying you can do whatever you want. I'm saying you need to believe in what you can't see and lay aside. We're going to see that in Moses in here in just a minute. Look at Noah. We've got to keep going. Verse 7. By faith, Noah, after being warned about what was not yet seen. Here's what Noah faced. There had, it had never rained before. Ever. Never rained and God, and he's out in the middle of nowhere, not by a lake or a sea or anything. He's out in the middle of nowhere, and God says, build a boat. Now, um, we know how it all ends, and so we know it's a good thing that he listened to God. I can't think of a good illustration, because we're far too educated and know too much about science and all that kind of stuff today. But if God asked you to do something that was just crazy and said, I want, you to, I want you to dedicate all of your money, all of your savings and retirement, I want you to dedicate the next several decades to doing something that just seemed nuts to everybody around, do you have the faith in what's unseen to do that? Well, sure, if it was going to flood. He didn't know it was going to flood. Right? He was warm, but he had to trust. He had to trust. It had never rained before. And he experienced all the mockings and all the, you know, I mean, he would be the town kook. But this is what the Bible says. In reverence, he built an ark to deliver his family. And by this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. He inherited righteousness because he believed in what was unseen. It's called faith. Abraham. There's three things with Abraham and Sarah, right? First of all, they were asked to go. Go. Then they, were, then they said, hey, you're going to have a, a child. And, and yeah, you're going to be about 100. And Sarah's going to be about 90. And I know it's not physically possible. We can read that in Romans. But he's just like, man, I just trust God. I know it doesn't make sense. I just trust God. And then, later on, he was asked to sacrifice that son that was promised to him and was going to be a blessing when he was a teenager. And he's like, all right, I guess God can raise him from the dead then. If that's what he wants me to do. But I want you to picture with me just for a second. 
Because Abraham going is just incredible to us. And again, let's be real. Because that's, that's our motto, right? A real church serving the real God for real life. Here's real life. For many of you, you still live in the same area that you've lived your entire life. Some of you live on your family farm. And I'm, I covet you. I, that's, I mean, I, I love that. That's awesome. But I want you to think about Abraham and what he did. If God came to you 30 years ago and said, I want you to sell your house and, and rent a U-Haul and get in. Pack all your stuff in there and hop in a U-Haul. Where am I going? I'll let you know. So you get all your stuff packed in a U-Haul. And God says, I'm going to take you somewhere. Where? I'm not going to tell you yet. Well, how long is it going to take? I'm not going to tell you. Where are we going? I'm not going to tell you. So what do you get in the U-Haul? Put your seatbelt on? Like, do I start it? Or what? I mean, I want you to think. This is real life. God says, I want you to go. Okay, God, I'm ready to go. What direction? All right, we'll start heading north. Okay, I'm going to head north. Do I need a hotel up? Do I, you don't, I'm not going to tell you. I'll let you know when you get there. How's your faith? Seriously, how is your faith? Would you be willing to do that? Seriously. This is what Abraham did. And God loved him for it and called him righteous for it. It's way too easy for us to know these stories and read through these stories and think, yeah, you know, he's pretty good, but I, I'd do that. I don't know. Like, you all wants to know where you're going to drop the truck off. I don't know. I'll just find one of your places when I get there. All right. Let's look down. Um, verse 20 talks about Isaac, and then there's Jacob and Joseph. Um, the parents of Moses put him in a, a basket. Now look at Moses. This is a good one. Um, verse 24. Hebrews eleven twenty-four. By faith, Moses, when he had called, uh, had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the short-lived pleasure of sin. Boom! Park it right there. Park it right there. When he's 40 years old, he gets mad because there's an Egyptian pick, picking on an Israelite, and he kills him. The, uh, I know this is true because I saw it in a, you know, a little um, cartoon thing. But it's probably true that he could have worked that out somehow, I'm pretty sure. But what he did is he left for 40 years. And then he came back and said, let my people go. And he dwelt with a bunch of, of wishy-washy Israelites on their way to the promised land that never got there for another 40 years. Now here's what he gave up. He is, he is the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Write your ticket. What do you want? You want fame? You want wealth? You want you know, good times and good living and all that kind of stuff? Moses had it. Instead, for 80 years, he finished out his life serving God. And this is what the Bible reminds us. That he, he would rather serve God than enjoy the short-lived pleasure of sin. His last 80 years was serving God instead of enjoying the most amazing life that anybody could ever imagine. And God reminds us that's a short-lived. Because there's a reward that's even greater. It's called eternity. It's called being in the presence of God for all of eternity. So here's what it says in verse 26. For he considered reproach for the sake of the Messiah to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, since his attention was on the reward. By faith he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger, for he persevered as one who sees him uh, who is vis invisible. By faith he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. Let's stop there for a second. How would this work out? 
Moses goes to his people. They're enslaved in, in Egypt, right? And he, everybody knows he's been going to, to Pharaoh and saying, God says, let my people go. Nine times these amazing plagues have happened and nothing, nothing. Pharaoh still says, no, no, no. So then Moses comes up and says, hey, I've gotten a word from God. Um, okay, but how's that been working for us so far, Moses? I mean, Pharaoh's seen all this other stuff. How's it working so far? No, 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 no. Here, here's what God said. God said to get a lamb, get a male lamb, get the best one you have, and then you have to go into your homes, and we're going to kill it, and, and we're gonna, you have to eat it all. So if you can't eat it all, you need to invite your friends over, whatever, and they need to stay in your house until morning. Don't leave. And oh, by the way, take the blood from the lamb and like put, put it on your door. Exactly. What? Okay. You, see, your problem is you know the end of the story. Moses did not. And he believed what was unseen. He still believed in God. So, see, if I came in next week, well, I won't be here. If Pastor Dusty comes in next week and, and has a lamb up here and a big knife, and he's going to invite you to put your hands in there and then spread the blood all over the wall, are you going to stay here? I hope not, probably. <laughs> but, but, you see, we know the story. We know the story, and it messes us up. Because Moses didn't know the story. And he goes to the people and says, well, this is what God said. Hmm. So are you ready? Are, are you ready to step out? Are you ready? See, I don't know if God's going to ask you to do something big, but we're going to hear from two missionaries here in, in just a few minutes. I don't, maybe God's going to ask you to do something big. Are you ready? Do you believe in the unseen God enough to say, okay, I'm going to sit in the U-Haul, I'm going to spread the blood, don't spread the blood, I'm going to do whatever He asked me to do, even if it doesn't make sense, because I believe in what's unseen. I have faith in God. Oh, I could talk about Rahab, I could talk about all... In, in, in Joshua, she says, you know what, we're all scared, we've all seen what you're doing, and, and we know you're coming at Jericho, and so she's sitting there, she's a prostitute, and she says, there's something special about her, though all the people were afraid, but she says, I believe that your Lord is the one true Lord. And that got her in the Bible, in, the, in, in Hebrews 11. And in Matthew chapter 1, as being the mother, her and Salmon got, got together, got married, right? Now, track, track me with this. She, she's in the promised land, so she's not a foreigner, but she's with all of these um, different people. All of her people are wiped out. She's in her land with all different people, so she would have fell out of place, would she not? And Salmon says, hey, you know what, Rahab, I want to marry you. And they get married, and they have a son named Boaz. And then Boaz, see, his mom was different than all the other moms. Not only in her past, but in her heritage. And she was different than all the other Israelite moms that, that Boaz grew up around. All the other Israelite kids had Israelite moms and Israelite dads, and her mom was different. And so then when he saw this, this girl, when Naomi came back from Moab with a foreigner girl named Ruth, Boaz took note of this girl that was out of place and became her kinsman redeemer. And now is in Matthew chapter 1 because Salmon begat Boaz by Rahab and they begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat King David in the line of Jesus. Wow. Because she believed in what she... She didn't know anything about God. She's sitting there 
doing an, an unrighteous occupation in a foreign country, she hears and she believes in something she can't see. That God is God. Hmm. Let me finish it out like this. Starting in verse 32, it says this, And what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah. You know, the, there are stories behind all these. We could sit here until Tuesday talking about the richness of what's going on here. Jephthah is, is one who was, by the way, his... He was born out of an adulterous affair, and so nobody liked him either. And he became this warrior, and all of a sudden, hey, we need this warrior and his guys. And so he made a vow to God that if God would give him victory over these people, that when he came back home, the first person to come greet him, he would sacrifice as a burnt offering. I don't know why you would do that. But then his only daughter, his only child, his daughter came out, and he fulfilled that vow to God. I mean, there's just, this just oozes with, I mean, this is like, uh, this is movie of the week stuff. Every single one of these guys. And then of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms and administered justice and obtained promises and shut the mouth of lions and quenched the raging fire and escaped the edge of the sword, and gained strength after being weak, and became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Some men were tortured, not accepting release, so that they might gain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, as well as bonds and imprisonment. And they were stoned, and they were sawed in two, and they died by the sword, and they wandered about in sheepskins, and in goatskins, and destitute, and afflicted, and mistreated, and the world was not worthy of them. And they wandered in deserts, and caves, and mountains, and caves, and holes in the ground. And all these were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us, so that they would not be made perfect without us. This, here's what that means. It starts off hard and ends hard. Here's what that means. They never saw Jesus, but they believed in what they had not seen. They trusted, had faith in what they had not seen, and so they served God in a mighty, mighty way taking on all kinds of despair and agony. So let me just ask you this question. Let's be honest before God Almighty. Let's just, I'll just have you do this. Just bow your heads. Don't let the hurried pace of my speaking take away from the, the depth and the, the patience that we're going to have in this moment. I want you to, the, to sit here before the Almighty God, honestly, and ask Him to assess you, both good and bad. Some of you are trending up. You're, you're pressing into God. You're in the, going in the right direction. And man, I'm proud of you. You're doing great. You're, you're, not, you're not there yet, but you're trending in the right direction. And you're, you love the Word of God. And you're trying to pray more. And you're trying to be more obedient. Man, you're an awesome job. Awesome job. Some of us have to honestly say before God that, okay, we haven't gone off the deep end. You know, we're just not we're not going crazy, but boy, we're just kind of starting to drift. We're starting to drift off that narrow path just a little bit. See, we can see it in our attitudes. It, it flares up in our in our language, and, and and maybe we don't love people like we should. Maybe we're a little impatient and a little angry and you know we're just starting to drift so how is your faith this post game evaluation how is your faith I'm not asking about your religiousness I'm asking about your faith in what's unseen do you trust in the unseen aspects of God are you willing to do whatever he asks you to do do you trust in his leading do you trust Him in... You fill in the blank. See, he's, he's showing you some things right now, isn't He? Do you trust in those things? 
What's that area of your life that he's pointing out to you right now? Let's, let's surrender that to him. Let's turn that over to him.